I'm going to beat all of their competitors' prices, or I'll give you the mattress for free. How's that sound? You look good. Let's sell some mattresses. Sales for me, you know, it's what makes the world go round. Um, and it's my life, you know. When I step out onto this showroom floor, it's my time to shine. It's my time to nominate. This is my coliseum, and I'm the gladiator. So, look out. Hey. Oh. <laughs> Cameron Hi. Coates, nice Hi. to meet you. Mary. I'll be taking care of today. Mary? Yes. What Hi. a great name, that's beautiful. And you are such a vision. Oh, Mwah. okay. Oh, Mary, what do I got to do to get you into bed today? <laughs> uh -huh. You know, really, I just want to serve the people. I want to use my knowledge to better mankind. This is 100% memory from Mattress, okay, with a circle knit top. It comes from our King Arthur collection, and we call it Excalibur. <sighs> Hop on up, Mary. Oh, no, that's not necessary. A lot of these guys out there, they're dishonest, you know? But I believe in truth in sales. Uh, this is a limited edition, which means it's a collector's item, which means that it will appreciate in value. So really think of this mattress as an investment into your financial future. I just love making people smile, you know? If at the end of the day, I've made at least one customer smile, then I've done my job, I've succeeded. I need them to buy something as well, of course, um, because they don't pay me for smiles. But um, I would be rich if they did. Some shows don't need a celebrity narrator to introduce the show. But this show does. In a world filled with endless opportunities, why would two men who have built 13 multi-million dollar businesses altruistically invest five hours per day to teach you the best practice business systems and moves that you can use? Because they believe in you. And they have a lot of time on their hands. They started from the bottom, now they're here. It's the Thrive Time Show starring the former U.S. Small Business Administration's Entrepreneur of the Year, Clay Clark, and the entrepreneur trapped inside an optometrist body, Dr. Robert Zutner. Two men, eight kids, co-created by two different women, 13 multi-million dollar businesses. Get ready to enter the Thrive Time Show. Now we're on the top, teaching you the systems to get what we got. Clinton Dixon's on the hooks, I break down the books. Z's bringing some wisdom and the good looks. As the father of five, that's why I'm alive. So if you see my wife and kids, please tell them hi. It's the C and Z up on your radio. And now three, two, one, here we go. We started from the bottom, now we here. All right, Thrive Nation, on today's show, we're going to talk about a topic that I prefer to talk about in pretty much exclusively if i if i had my way this is all i would talk about this is all i would be doing all day every day and that is sales mm. i'm going to play a clip for you in just a minute here folks so you can see what it looks like to have a whale a, a well uh, organized uh, sales team working for you and then on part 2 of today's show i'm going uh, to share uh, an interview i did with jerry vass the the best selling author of a book called soft selling in a hard world and i i love selling. And if you're listening today and you have a team of people on your in your a company and their sales are less than great, this is the show for you. If you have a, a team of people and you say they just are not selling well, the leads are coming in, but they're just not selling well. I'm going to teach you how to build the ultimate sales machine. and I'm going to teach you 10 super moves that you can use to immediately and dramatically grow your company and to increase their sales volume. And if you do this, if you implement these moves, if you implement these moves, you're going to have a lot of success, okay? So move number one, Sean, I'm going to have you read off the move, and I'm going to explain what the move means. Move number one, write a proven call script. If you do not have a call script in place that has been proven to work, your team is not going to have any success. And they're going to say weird stuff. They're going to say weird stuff. And you've worked with a lot of great clients, Sean, as a business consultant over the past five plus years. Mm -hmm. What percentage of business owners that have you have you that you've worked with had a script in place before you worked with them? None of them had it written down, and I've actually never had one of them that had anything consistent being said either before we worked with them. So repeat that again. 
Well, well, never have there ever been a single client that I've worked with that has had what they're supposed to say on the phone through their sales funnel uh, actually written down. And so because of that, when we start listening to calls, I've never yet had a consistent... It's an abomination. Yeah. It's an abomination. So you got to have a pre-written call script. Now, Mm -hmm. move number two, Sean... You gotta have the call recording for yeah. quality control and provide a manager to provide real time feedback on those calls. Every single day, the calls are recorded. We use a, a service called ClarityVoice.com. ClarityVoice.com. But in our office, you know, the phones ring all the time. People are requesting tickets to a, come to a conference, um, and so when they request a ticket to come to a business conference, I want to know what our people are actually saying to people on the phone. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I want to know that. Oh, yeah. I want to know. I want to know. I want to know what they're being. That way I can give them feedback on what they can say, how they can improve their sales, mm-hmm. how you know, give them positive reinforcement, tell them what they could do better. You got to have the call recording. If you don't have the call recording in place, that would be like being an NFL football coach and not watching game film or even watching the game. Mm-hmm. That'd be like being an NFL coach and you go, guys, here's the playbook. I'm going to go over to Denny's. They've got a special going on today. I'll be there getting my grand slam. I'll see you guys after the game. And then you come back the next week and go, you lost? Mm. Are you kidding me? Mm. I gave you the playbook. Mm -hmm. So you you also have to have real-time in-person coaching or training provided to your salespeople. So I, every single day, all day, every day, and I love doing it, I make sure that I'm giving my team feedback on what they could do Better, and I have a, a manager who that's their job mm-hmm. to give them feedback throughout the day. But I also do that, and if I did not do that, and if the calls were not recorded, what would happen, Sean? Well, even if the script is written and you're not recording the calls, you're very quickly going to realize that nobody is actually going to stick to that script oh. in any way, shape, or form. Love sales, and unless it's a written down, yep. and b there's a manager making sure that that happens. Have I told you I love sales? Yes, I love yes. sales. I love it. I love sales. Yeah, I love it. It's uh, it, there's a lot of people are scared of sales, I but love sales. It, it's a it's really actually a pretty tried and true thing. It, there's proven systems and steps to make sales not some ethereal mystical thing that only certain people can do, but it like can make it to where somebody who's not all that intelligent and doesn't know much about your service is able to actually help you sell it. You know, my top sales guy back in the day with one of my companies called EpicPhotos.com. I no longer own that company, um, but he knew nothing about photography Mm. and he was the top photography sales guy because he just followed the script. Mm -hmm. It works. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now the next move, number three is you got to install a call quota. Oh yeah. You have to make sure that the people on your team are Mm -hmm. adhering to a set number of calls they have to make every day. Now, yesterday I was was asking James to keep track of his call totals. I do it every day, but I just asked him yesterday, how many Mm -hmm. calls did you make? He's averaging 300 phone calls a day. Oh yeah. Every single day. I love that. Oh, yeah. Now, why is it that somebody would go to thrivetimeshow.com and fill out the form? Mm-hmm. We have a guy named Chad right now. Chad, if you're listening right now, this is this goes out to Chad. There's an actual <laughs> guy named Chad right now who has filled out the form to attend the workshop. Mm-hmm. And we've probably called this bro 50 times. Mm. Yep. And he emails in, hey, I really want to attend the conference. How do I get a ticket? And we, we're calling him. Mm-hmm. We're emailing him. We are. I mean, we. I'm not kidding. It's probably 50 contacts deep between call text and email that's impressive because he just won't pick up the phone yeah but a lot of our longtime great clients were people that they had to call them 10 times or more did you know that the average person that requests a haircut at elephant in the room our haircut chain Mm -hmm. has to be called an average of six times before they pick up the phone and schedule that haircut i did know that yeah because crazy when, when i'm working with my clients um until i tell them that that's a that's a very foreign thought they it's almost like clay they think that uh, by calling somebody that many times they're somehow doing them a disservice uh even though the person reached out for information so i, I don't really get it but a lot of people are hesitant with that and if you just tell your team look i'm grading you on how many times you've reached out to them right. not on getting a hold of them right i need i need to get a hold of them but i want you to reach out at least six times every yeah. day that yeah. might wreck your head but please just do it they'll get a hold of a whole lot more people and your leads will close faster holy cow oh incredible i think you Harry carry i just think it's very important that we understand this idea 
that if you call your leads until they cry by or die, that's the attitude you have to have. Mm -hmm. Cry being, uh, stop calling me. I'm getting like 50 times. Uh, my name's Chad, and you've called me 50 <laughs> times and texted me 100 times. What oh, hey, Chad, how are you doing? Uh, I'm just tired of this. Why do you keep calling What's me? What's crazy about this guy, Chad, right now is Chad <laughs> claims that he listens to our show every day, yeah. and he's super excited to come to our conference. <laughs> and we've called this guy so many times, he won't pick up the phone. <laughs> This just in. Chad, reach out to us. Yeah. And I, and I do. I, I love sales so much that I tell people, if you want to request a ticket, you can text me directly at 918-851-0102. That's the move, Chad. If you're listening right now, just, <laughs> just do that. Make the connection. <laughs> just cause. Chad, you, all you got to do is just text me. 918-851-0102. Okay. Yeah. Now you got again. You got to track your numbers. The move number four. You got to track your numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, no. you track your numbers. You have to track your numbers. And I'm just being very clear with you. Being very clear with you. Yesterday, I was looking at the numbers. We got one person on the team who sold like 27 tickets for mm -hmm. a workshop. Mm -hmm. And then somebody else sold four. Mm. And they're in the exact same office, calling the exact same quality of leads. But if you don't track, you don't know who needs to improve. You don't know who's doing well. You just. Holy cow. You're screwed. Yeah. You got to track. But yeah. what percentage of people, business owners that you know, mm -hmm. track before they met you? Uh, they, they track Clay by opening up their bank account and going, do I have money? It's ridiculous. That's what they. Total, that's what total doing. Jack answered the highest order. Okay, mm -hmm. we continue now. Now you got to move number five. You have to create pre-written text messages. Uh, move number six. You got to create pre-written email messages. Move number seven. What? Move number five. You have to create pre-written text messages. Move number six. Create pre-written email messages. You've got to pre-write, pre-script out, pre-write these email and text messages that your team are sending out. Because in today's culture, people reach out to you on your website or via email or via text or whatever, and you have to you have to call, text, and email these people. And you want to make sure that the the text messages that your team uh, are sending out are pre written and the emails are pre written. Because if not, when you see what your team will send prospects, oh no, it's like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. <laughs> it's like I picked the wrong week to quit smoking. Mm. It's like I picked the wrong week to quit drinking. Like I picked the wrong week to quit amphetamines. Will you see the kind of stuff? <laughs> I didn't realize they were doing amphetamines back then, but that sounded like the fifties. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> that's the movie Airplane, by the way. Okay. But I'm just saying, it's a, it's a, it's a thing. It's mm -hmm. a thing where people, people, if you don't give them a pre-written script of what the text or email needs to say, they will send crazy stuff out to your ideal and likely buyers. Yeah, or they just won't send anything at all and you'll have a lower rate of people showing up for your appointments and whatnot. You've got to have a pre-written text or email. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, again, a part two of today's show, I'm going to share with you guys an interview I did with Jerry Vass. Uh, he's phenomenal. Jerry Vass, he wrote the book called Soft Selling in a Hard World. And I'm also going to share with you footage of the call center of a company I built back in the day called djconnection.com running at full speed. And the thing is, I love... Sales. Have I talked about how much I love sales? Have I mentioned that yet? Once or twice. Yeah. I love sales. <laughs> Seriously, on a, on a good Saturday, if you said, hey, Saturday, weather's great outside. You could be anywhere in the world. Where would you be? I'd say, well, run a call center. Mm. Uh, I love sales. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> sales is incredible. Yeah, it's so fun. You can make a lot of money when you're when you just know the moves. I mean, I've it, done it in the dog training business. I've done it in the haircut business. Done it in the carpet cleaning business. Done it in the uh, outdoor living business. Done it in the indoor living business. Done it in the home remodeling business. I've done it in the uh, home flipping business. I've done it in the, the new home selling business. I've done it in every every business. Mm -hmm. I've done the legal business. Mm. Done it in the dentistry business. Mm -hmm. And I just love sales. Mm. It's so good. And some people are so afraid of it. Yep. And that's that's why move number seven is so important. Move number seven, you must conduct the group interview every week. Now, someone says, what's the group interview? Uh, long story short, we have entire shows about this. But every Wednesday at 530, I interview people that applied to work here. And just so you see, you know the numbers. About 75 people a week say, I am going to come to the interview Wednesday at 530. Mm. Of that 75, about 45 show up. 
of that 45 that show up, maybe 15 of them mentally show up. Mm-hmm. Another 15 show up. Not They're not mentally here. Yeah. Another 15 show up incredibly late. The interview's at 5.30. They might show up at 6.22 just to see what happens. <laughs> yeah. I'm serious. Every week. <laughs> Every week. And we, so this week we, got, we, got an, we have three great people mm-hmm. that I think are going to be great members of the team. Mm-hmm. And we have other tasks we do. I mean, we have videolog- videographers, photographers, web developers, uh, search engine optimizers, remodelers, people on payroll, you know, yeah, haircut people uh, with the companies I'm partnered with. We have dog trainers. I mean, there's so many different jobs we have. Mm-hmm. But none of that matters if you can't sell anything. True. Yeah. Why will everything fail? Why Why, why does everything fail without sales? Why? why Everything fails without sales. Why, Sean? Cash is the lifeblood of the business. Like, you have to have money to run the company. And if you don't, then you can't pay for things. And if you're not selling, you won't have any money. So you won't be able to pay for things. And that's actually how most businesses fail, is they run out of money. So you you have to make sales like a burning, hot, crazy, maniacal focus and passion as a startup and then just never lose that. Uh, hey, real quick, I'm not going to argue with you on, on this show, but I want to I just call into question something you just said. Here. Okay. Just, it creates a little conflict, and the listeners love it. Uh-huh. They love the conflict. Uh that's why they watch the, the view. Uh, <laughs> the conflict? No, they do. The they, want, they want one guy who's like going to go on ESPN and argue the arg- or the other mm. side. Yeah, the know? Skip Bayless guy who's just going to. It's argue. like, you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like one team is 13 and three going against a team that's, uh, you know, they ended the year seven and nine. Somehow they're in the playoffs together. Mm. And they want to uh, they want to find some talking head to come on and go. The seven and nine team is the underdog. They're gonna win. You're an idiot for thinking that. And then the guy who's the, well, the yeah. guy who's advocating for the team that's thirteen and three to win, he's like, uh, I, I think you're clearly wrong here. And the other, the other guy's, no, you're you're an idiot. And then they want him to fight. <laughs> yep. And then they go to commercial. Yep. That's what they do. Yeah. Uh, this this just did. But I'm, I'm not doing that for that. I'm just telling you. I think that <laughs> it, your businesses fail, and it's not because you run out of money. You run out of money because your business failed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, at the end of the day, what is a business? It's a business is you sell something low, you, you, you buy something low, you sell it high. You buy something low, you sell it high. You're, you're, you're solving a problem for people at a profit. Mm-hmm. And if you have a business that doesn't have any money, you're done. You're not, you're not in business. It's just like a weird-ass hobby or something that you're doing that doesn't, that's not profitable. Yeah. It's just like a weird passion project. It's not a, a business. And so I just, I'm not saying you're incorrect. I just want to make sure we get this idea. Yeah. It, 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 I think it's, you know, if you see a dead person, you go to the funeral and you're like, you know, the reason why he died is because he's not living. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm just saying without sales, your business will fail. It's just, that's a thing. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. just how it is. It just, people, they just, you know, why did his business fail? They didn't sell anything. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. Well, I, but they were selling a lot of things. Not at a profit. Oh, okay. Okay. So you got to sell something at a profit. I, I, I agree with you. I just want to hammer home that idea. Now, yeah. uh, move number seven. You got to conduct that group interview. We talked about that every single week. Every week. Every week. Every week. Every week. Every week. Every. I feel like you're saying every week. There's a lot of stress here. Got to rise. Mm-hmm. Got a, a lot of pressure here. A lot of pressure. Well, it is. I mean, every week. I, it's my birthday. Feel it. It's circular. It's like a carousel. You pay the quarter, you get on the horse. It pay goes up quarter. and down and around. Uh, circular, circle, with the music, the flow, <laughs> all good things. You have to do the group interview every week. A lot week. of pressure. you got to rise above it. Every week. you got to harness in the good energy. Every week. Block out the bad. Harness, pay the energy, quarter. block, bad. Pay the carousel. Feel the flow happy. Feel, Feel it. it. It's circular. Circular. It's like a carousel. You Bend pay the, the quarter, you get on Bend the, the horse. It goes up and down. Round and, and around. around. Uh, circular, keeps turning. circle, with the music, the flow. All good things. All summer, good things. summer. A lot of pressure. Fall. You gotta rise above it. <laughs> summer, mm-hmm. fall. Harness in the good winter, energy. Spring. Block out the bad. Summer, Harness, fall. Harness energy. Winter, block spring. bad. Feel the flow. Group happy. interview. Feel Every it. week. It's Every circular. Week, group interview. It's like a carousel. You Monday, pay the quarter. You get Tuesday, on the horse. It goes Wednesday, up and down. Thursday, and around. Friday, Friday, circular, Saturday, circle Sunday. with the music. The you flow. have to do it. All good things. It's what it's what we do. Every week. It's why we don't have a problem with people who don't stick to the script ever. It's why we Ever. don't have a problem with people who don't call the leads that much because you know they, they because they should. You but. know what's so crazy about this show? Mm. We'll have millions of listeners that listen to this show. Yeah, but almost no one who works here ever listens. Mm. 
<laughs> yeah. Because they're not interested in how to become successful. Yeah. So I true. have people that work in my companies that have no interest at all. They are literally 10 to 15 feet away from a person that knows how to make millions of dollars. <laughs> and they never, ever, ever ask how to become successful. Yeah. Nor do they ever listen to the show. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to tell people the date I recorded this show, but I'm just going to give you an example. I'm looking out my window in the studio here. Mm -hmm. And we've got a lady on our team who her job is to call our clients to call um she calls the former clients of my clients so so one of my clients is in the medical space right yep so her job is to call their former patients right and to ask them for objective reviews yes her job is to call one of my clients is in the fitness space her job is to call his active clients and get reviews mm -hmm. and they're a client of mine home building space she calls his clients to get reviews yep and she is awful mm. at the job so mm. she gets paid twelve dollars an hour, which is probably too much. Plus, mm -hmm. every time she gets a review, she gets five dollars. Mm -hmm. Now we have a young guy by the name of Danimal who just left to go to college. Mm -hmm. His name is Dan. I call him Danimal. Danimal. Yeah. Danimal would get twenty reviews in a day. Mm -hmm. He's making a hundred dollars of commission. Plus, he's making ninety six dollars. Yep. That dude, eighteen years old, making two hundred dollars a day. Yeah. Doing this job. Mm -hmm. This person doesn't ever get a review. Yeah. Ever. She's just awful. Mm -hmm. And then she says. Well, I just I don't I don't like it. It doesn't matter if you like it. You're hired to do this job. Yeah. And and I could freely state this. Mm -hmm. And she will not ever come up to the me and say, "Were you talking about me on the show?" Cuz she doesn't listen to the show. Mhm. Mm ever. Yeah. I could name them by names on the show. <laughs> yeah. And they would never know. <laughs> because they don't listen to the show. Cuz they have no curiosity about how to have success. Now, why does that matter to our listeners? Because if you have a business mm -hmm. and you're like, guys, the, the key to us improving sales is I want you guys to sit down and read The Ultimate Sales Machine and Soft Selling in a Hard World and How to Win Friends and Influence People. They're not going to read it. Yeah. The, 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 you're, you, you, if you give your whole staff a book to read, Sean, why are they not going to read it? Uh, that would require them to spend their own personal time. Which, which they're, they're not, not going to do. For. Yeah. And they don't care. <laughs> Yep. And even if they were being paid, they would read the book and not know what, what it was about. Why? Well, it was basically, when I was in school, I was a terrible student, but I did the same thing with AR, accelerated reading. Right. I wouldn't read the book. I would go get the cliff notes, and then I would just take the test right. and forget everything in the book. Let's just be real, folks. That's what it is. Yeah. That's what it is. I yeah. mean, let's be real. Let's be real. Women, Facebook, Instagram, women, women on Instagram, mm -hmm. Facebook, they're going to put a filter on that thing. Oh, uh, every time. Every yeah. time. Mm -hmm. And you meet her in person, and you're like, it's Sharon? Because <laughs> it doesn't look like Sharon? No. And Sharon found the best photo of her from, like, her junior year of volleyball <laughs> yeah. in high school. Yep. And she's now 54, uh -huh. and that's the headshot. Because mm -hmm. people are going to fake that mess. Yep. People in your call center are going to fake those numbers. Mm -hmm. People are going to, I did my best. I read the book. It's awesome. No, I'm giving you the 10 moves you need to use to grow a super successful company. Okay. So now... Move number eight, you got to create a universal pricing list. Everybody on your team needs to know what you're charging for the products and services you're selling. Right? Yes. You absolutely. have to have a universal pricing list. Move number nine, mm -hmm. you have to create a weekly training meeting. Every single week, we train our people at the same time every week. You know why? Because I don't have to tell the team, hey, guys, let's try to get together this week. No, it's every Tuesday at 7 a.m. That's when we're doing sales training. Yes, and it's it's important to mention that it's every Tuesday. Every because Tuesday? Because he did, he did say weekly. you got to rise right? above it. There's mm -hmm. a lot of circular energy. things going on block with this. Group interview Harness every energy, week. Block sales back. meeting Feel the flow every happy. week. Feel it. Sales meeting. Meeting is when, Sean? It's, like it's every week. Tuesday. Group interview is when? Every week on Wednesday. Every week? Every week. Every week. Circle. Every single week. Seems like it's the same thing over and over. It is the same thing over and over. <laughs> People hate that. <laughs> I don't know why. It's I love makes it. Money. It makes money. It does make money. It blows my mind. Okay. Yeah. Move number nine. You got to create that weekly uh, training meeting. And then move number 10, final move. And then we'll get into J Jerry Bass, soft selling in a hard world. And by the way, I'm going to share with you guys footage in just a second of me running a call center at one of my companies called DJ Connection back in the day. And I love that business. And you know the average person was making 300 calls a day at that business? That doesn't surprise me. I love 300 calls a day. Yeah. I don't understand the kind of person that doesn't want to make calls all day. I don't get it. It's so fun. You make calls, you make more money. You make more money, you make more calls. Mm -hmm. Steve, hop on mic three. You like making calls. You're a, you're a mortgage guy. Steve? Oh, yeah. You like making calls, right? Yeah, I mean, you have to. SteveCurrington.com, that's the website. You sell mortgages. By the way, you also uh, have multiple Lamborghinis, and you have a private plane. Yeah, rumor has it you had to exchange money in exchange for the goods and services you, you want, right? Yep. And yeah. so you have to sell mortgages, am I correct? 
Yeah, I have to. I have to pick up the phone and make a lot of calls all day long, every day. And I have since I was about 19. You like it, a, though. Yeah. Bro, you like it. Yeah. I like it. I mean, you know what? It uh, sucks if you don't, because then you don't have any money. So. <laughs> <laughs> Put that on a shirt, folks. That's SteveCurrington.com. He just happened to be in the studio. I thought we should get hear from him. Final move is you got to create a transparent commission structure for your team. So, Steve, at SteveCurrington.com, if anybody goes there, you provide mortgages in all 50 states. Yep. If anybody goes there right now to apply for a mortgage, this just in, you make a commission to do that. Yep. If you didn't know what the commission was that you were going to make, and it was kind of a murky weird sort of nebulous number how motivated would you be to sell mortgages i wouldn't be motivated i would kill whoever that was that was murky and i would take their job <laughs> kill, and a, I would and, kill it in a metaphorical kind of way <laughs> yeah exactly i would whack them clay <laughs> whack the mole whack the mole but seriously <laughs> yeah you gotta know you gotta know what you're gonna make every time you sell something which is what motivates you to pick up the phone to make the call to sell something mm -hmm. so that you get the payoff at the end otherwise you know you get to the end of rainbow and there's no gold there and it kind of stinks right womp womp you know, so. the, uh, uh, this, is, this is a quote. You, I know you said, you said payoff. You didn't say playoffs. Right. But it works here, okay? Very <laughs> Listen to this. Listen similar. to this audio. Playoffs? Don't talk about it. Playoffs? You kidding me? Playoffs? I just hope we can win a game. This is, that was the coach, Jim Mora, back in the day. And I reporters asked him about his team. The playoffs? They're asking him, sir, what are your plans for the playoffs? How do you guys think you'll do in the playoffs this year? And he's like, playoffs? Playoffs? <laughs> You talking about playoffs? I just hope we win a game. <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to win game one. Okay. I'm not so about I just playoffs. want to be clear, though, is all the business owners are talking about payoffs. Yeah. Payoffs? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to get you to make a phone call. Right. Payoffs? Yeah. You're talking about payoffs? Yep. I'm talking about, I'm just being real. Yesterday, James and, and Devin and the team, they each made about 300 phone calls each. Yeah. And guess what? They each sold about 30 tickets to a conference. These are inbound leads. Mm-hmm. Steve, why would you have to call, make 300 phone calls to inbound leads to sell 30 conference tickets? Well, you know, people sign up for things and then they wake up the next day and wonder why or 30 seconds later wonder why. Whose and pants am I wearing? So, yeah, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you, you know, we've, been, we've gone through a time, I would say like the Trump era when things were good, right? Rates were low, people had money, people low were rates. buying things, yeah. everything was great. And now... They're not so great, and you know what it means? It means that you actually have to sell, and that's you got to work that thing. You actually have to have to sell. You can't just go lay down like everybody was a lay down from 2016 to 2020, yeah. basically, right? And now all of these salespeople that were just getting these lay down sales, yeah. they're now having to work, and they're actually having to sell, and they can't. Because they suck, and it sucks to suck. <laughs> now, now this is this is one thing, and I'll, I'll leave you with this little idea. This is this is an example of how you could really sell right now with the high interest how, with the high interest rates. Mm. You ready for this, Sean? Oh yeah. I'm gonna pretend that I'm a mortgage guy. Okay. Sean, good news: the interest rates are at an all time high. Yeah. More people are are interested than ever. I don't know if that's what that means. <laughs> <laughs> More people are interested than ever. The interest rates are at an all time high. That's a good news. <laughs> also, also think about it. You're gonna love that house because you're gonna be paying a lot for it. Uh, Think about it, right? Uh, right. I mean, you 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 treasure what you you, you measure, and you're gonna yeah. be paying a lot. Is it, That's is that, exciting. Does that work, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, it does work in some situations. Like when people are getting divorced, I'll be oh, like, Look, yeah. the rate is double, but you're getting rid of her. And there you like, go. Sign right here. Thank you. Have a good day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, but I mean, you've got to. I mean it though. You have to learn sales. Yeah, you, you do. have to learn sales. And again, soft selling in a hard world by Jerry Vass is an incredible book that everyone should read. Uh, I don't know if you will read it, but you should read it. Mm -hmm. And on, we went over the 10 moves you need to use to build an ultimate sales machine. And on part two of today's show, we're going to introduce or play an audio with the late, great Jerry Vass, where I interviewed him about his best-selling book, Soft Selling in a Hard World. And if you're out there today and you want to attend one of our in-person uh, Thrive Time Show workshops, just go to thrivetimeshow.com. You'll see thousands of testimonials, and you can request tickets there to attend the in-person Thrive Time Show workshops. If you're looking for a mortgage in all 50 states, go to stevecurrington.com. Boom. And if you're somebody out there that's uh, uh, you know concerned that interest rates went up, that's right. The interest rates have gone up. People are more interested than ever right now, Steve. People are more yes. interested. The yes. interest rates have gone up. Th think about this, Clay. <laughs> because rates are so high, yeah. you have the opportunity to refinance later. Oh. You know what I mean? Oh. So that means you could talk to me now. 
And you can talk to me in like two years. And it's more and memorable, to too. And it's more <laughs> memorable, too, right? And yeah, and we're doing Lamborghini rides only for customers. So Ooh, think about how no-brainer. much money you're going to save if you would have had to buy a Lamborghini just for your kid to get a ride versus do a mortgage. <laughs> maybe you double your interest rate, but you get to spread that out over Steve, time, and you get to refinance. Steve, there are people, as we wrap up, there are people that, that uh, do vacations that are terrible. Yeah. And they'll go, yeah, we made memories, though. Um, pretty much everyone I know who's been to Disney World is like, it was the surface of the sun, and we sweat the whole time, and it's pretty yeah, expensive, it was terrible. and we hated it. <laughs> but we made memories. Yeah. Well, one way to make memories is to spend a lot of money on that mortgage. There you go. Hey, I mean, that's a memorable thing. You won't forget it. You won't forget it. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's right. Isn't that amazing? Right. Yep. Okay. Well, that's it. That's a, by the way, if you're thinking about proposing to her, do it on the day the mortgage is due. <laughs> there you go. So you'll never forget that. <laughs> yeah. <day. laughs> that's awesome. Okay. Wow. Well, at stevecurrington.com. That's Sean Loman. He's a beautiful man. And again, folks, get those tickets at thrivetimeshow.com. No J no venue 2014. That second or that third package? Those those packages are regularly eight hundred and nine hundred dollars. However, with, with, the, with the price special this week, um, was, was the price of actually six hundred or seven hundred dollars. Nice little buzz in the room. Nice little buzz in the room. It's getting pretty crazy. I black out from like three to nine, and then at nine o'clock I wake up and there's just a bunch of this money on my desk. I don't know where it came from. I got to remind myself we're working. It's a lot of fun. It's hard to sort. Do you, do you just use the money to heat your home? You, just, you don't know what to do with all the extra That's money? That's one way to do it, but a lot of times, you know, we just want to make sure that it gets to the right person. Mm. So. Makes sense. Two men, 13 multi-million dollar businesses, eight kids. Get ready to enter the Thrive Time Show. We started from the bottom, now we hit. We started from the bottom, and we'll show you how to get here. We started from the bottom, now we hit. Nation, there are very few legal ways to get rich quick. Your, your chance of finding one of those opportunities is very, very slim, or about uh, twice the odds of, of getting hurt in a commercial plane crash twice. Now, the bright side is that getting rich slowly is actually fun and will yield you thousands of adventures in the process. And on today's show, we're interviewing a guy by the name of Jerry Vass, who wrote a book called Soft Selling in a Hard World, where he explains in great detail that there are only three ways to really make exceptional money as an entrepreneur. One, you you got you to work in a place where no one else wants to be. I had a buddy of mine years ago that was an Alaskan fisherman fishing in Alaska. Sounds like a lot of fun. No, it's not. Uh, I had one of our employees years ago that worked on an oil rig out there in uh, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Rumor has it we have a couple of podcast subscribers uh, located in the Gulf of Mexico who listen to each and every show. And I know you guys probably don't enjoy the time away from your family and living on a on a floating city that smells like oil, but you, you get paid well, right? The, the second way to get rich is you can perform work that no one else wants to do. Sales. No one seems to want to do sales. Uh I like doing sales, but a lot of people fear sales. They're, they're scared of sales. They just don't know how to sell. And when you can't sell, your business will just go to hell. And the third, the third way to get rich is to do work that no one else can do. Well, Steph Curry can do that, and, and uh, he was pretty awesome at it. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio could, could do that, and he was pretty great at it. I mean, Oprah, I don't know how many people could do what Oprah does. Uh, Serena Williams, Venus Williams. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that are LeBron James that can do things that I frankly can't do, and that's why I like to pay people with that kind of skill. I like like to watch them. I like to vote with my dollars and say, yeah, Brad Pitt, uh, you're a better actor than me, Mr. Tom Hanks. You're better than me. I like to pay pay to watch your movie. So, again, the three ways to get rich are you can work in a place where no one else wants to be, you could do work that no one else wants to do, or you could perform work nobody else can do. And it's really the last two conditions for making extraordinary money that we're going to explore on today's show. You see, learning to sell softly isn't only about money. It's about 
enjoying the process of sales. This little uh, manual called Soft Selling in a Hard World is all about reality. It's about a survival guide for the, the strange mastering of, of persuasion. It's, it's, it's a kind of a strange road to learning how to master persuasion. It shows you how to, uh, it shows you the mechanics. Soft selling in a hard world teaches you the mechanics needed to sell well. That's what the book is about. The book is designed to teach you the specific tactics, not the strategy, to walk you through the step-by-step process that you need to take. And the whole system, what's great about it is you can learn the whole system uh, and, and implement the system and write all the scripts and utilize the system in a way where other people can do what you can do. You can make yourself repeatable and duplicatable. So you can create not just a job, but you can create a thriving business that can create both time freedom and financial freedom for you. My friend, selling is the highest paid profession in the world. I mean, our leaders in politics, business and research and the arts, they're all great salespeople. And just a lot of times you don't realize that they're selling. I mean, you see presidential candidates, heads of companies. I mean, Steve Jobs was legendary for his annual presentations. Warren Buffett. Uh, you don't think of Joel Osteen as selling, but he's trying to convince you to uh, become a, 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 a Christian. He's trying to share with you the love of Christ. You might not think of Oprah as a salesperson, but she's trying to convince you to tune in and watch the show again. You, you might not think about President Obama as a salesperson, but he's trying to get you to, to, to vote for him. He was trying to get you to vote for his ideology. So if you've ever struggled to sell, to, to, to sell, if you've ever struggled to sell well, this show is for you. Or if you're very good at sales, but you've ever struggled to teach a team of people with no experience to sell, that's where the magic is. Can you teach an army of people to sell well? If you've ever struggled with learning how to personally sell or how to teach an army of people to sell, you are going to absolutely love today's show as I interview a great man, a, a, a wonderful friend of the show, Jerry Vass. Jerry Vass, at the age of 83, is now retired, enjoying the, the high life there, uh, living in Florida, enjoying uh, his home in Jacksonville and, and uh, the fruits of his efforts. But he decided to come on to the show uh, my friend Jerry Vass decided to come onto the show and to share with us uh, the answers to so many questions that I had uh, as a result of reading his book, Soft Selling in a Hard World. If you don't have the book, get it today. Get out a pen and pad. you got to get out a piece of paper. This is a show where you got to take a lot of notes, and I would encourage you to get Soft Selling in a Hard World today. Without any further ado, my exclusive interview with Jerry Vass. Also, just a quick disclaimer. I apologize for the audio quality of this audio-only interview, but his phone was kind of cutting out a little bit. We tried to edit it the best that we could. And so without any further ado, here's Jerry Vass. All right, Thrive Nation, welcome back to another great conversation. And on the Thrive Time show today, uh, Chup, I could not be more excited Come on. to have uh, the man that I would consider the godfather of of systemic sales. You see, back in the day, Eric, uh, I uh, started working in the world of commercial real estate. Uh, One of my clients wanted to go into commercial real estate. And before we exited Fears and Clark, we actually had the commercial real estate listings for one-third of downtown Tulsa. That's roughly 33%. And do you know know what, what sales book we use to build our scripts, our systems, our processes, the entire system that we used at Fears and Clark when representing Can Bar properties and roughly one third of downtown Tulsa. Do you know what system, what book we read, Chuck? What book was it, Clay? Soft Selling in a Hard World by you, Mr. Vass. How are you, sir? <laughs> I'm perfect. Thank you very much. And I want to tell you, I'm flattered by all of this. Uh, I'm not used to doing this anymore because I've been out of the training business for 10 years. Because I got old and my mind went. We took a my mind took a vacation. So that, but we'll do the best we can. Well, I appreciate you, and you are much uh, sharper than I am. I, I aspire to be half as sharp as you think you once were. I mean, you you are uh, your book is amazing. The book "Soft Selling in a Hard World." And in that book, Jerry, um, you wrote, "If you aren't selling up to your potential, you probably don't understand that selling is a game. Most people don't." Those who do make 85% of the money become executives or run their own successful businesses. This book is about fulfilling your potential without resorting to motivational and inspirational beliefs. 
As in sports, you find that certain mechanical moves need to be mastered before your inspiration or genius can shine. Like a dog, a dog can be inspired to chase a car, but doesn't know what to do with the car once it's caught it. This knowledge is about what, what you do when you catch the car. That thin slice of face-to-face -face time when the buyer, when with the buyer, when persuasion really occurs. Jerry, I'd love for you to expound on this, and I just that's such a beautiful excerpt from your book. I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Surely. Well, I use the word game in the sense of a professional sport, and just as any professional sport, one has to understand the game, develop and polish the skills needed and have a plan for the big contest. In selling, that translates to getting your story together, getting your tools ready, and practicing your delivery. Then putting it all together under pressure in front of a prospective client. You may hear someone say, you know, if my job doesn't work out, I can always sell. You never hear them say, if my job doesn't work out, I can always be an NFL quarterback. Right, right. And I, I think the, the preparation that you teach in your book is what allowed me to be successful. Because, Jerry, when I was sitting down meeting with somebody about listing their commercial real estate, they would ask me directly, how many other listings do you have? And I would tell them, we have this many listings. And they would say, what makes you different than the competition? And I had it all on a one sheet. I had all my sales presentations. I had all my testimonials all my statistics. I had a, a system for it. I had incorporated all seven of your sell, selling moves, and it helped me be proactive so that I could lead the conversation, build rapport with the buyer, find their needs, deliver benefits supported by facts, and close deals. Jerry, in your book, Soft Selling in a Hard World, you wrote that sales is a profession identified with the worst of its practitioners. Uh, on behalf of that group, uh, I apologize for anybody who I did a poor hey sales presentation on years ago. Not it the happens, best. It happens. Because they sell so well, the public doesn't identify those that are at the top of the cultural heap. The politicians, the movie stars, the talk show hosts, the televangelists, and the business leaders, the world doesn't view these people as salespeople, as outstanding salespeople. They're rarely caught practicing the selling trade. The best of them are so good that people simply like their quote-unquote personalities, because people easily confuse skill with personality. When you study the best, you find that they make many mechanical selling moves right. Is this due to practice or coincidence? Natural talent or learned response? Only they know for sure how much is talent and how much is learned. The results are the same. They convince, move ideas, create change, and solve problems. We love them for it, and we reward them with the best our culture offers, fame, fortune, cool clothes, and a big house. Jerry, share with us about what great selling is and what bad selling looks like. Well, great selling is problem solving, pure and simple. You find the buyer's real problem and working with the buyer to solve it. You work together. To do that, you have to ask intelligent questions and listen intently. Bad selling is vomiting your stuff, talking, pitching about your stuff, and seeing the whole transaction only from your own point of view. Successful selling is explaining well what you do from the client's point of view. As in any activity, when someone is really good at what they do, it looks easy, even effortless. It's transparent. And whether it's running a podcast or playing tennis or skiing or selling, we all think we can, we, we can do, I can do that until we try and learn how difficult it is. Oh, that is, you know, that, the one thing, uh, Eric, that happened to us years ago is we were approached, uh, Jerry, by the Scripps uh, Radio Network. Mm -hmm. uh, they produce HGTV, the Travel Channel, and they said, Clay, we'd like to have you produce a show that we're going to air in various markets throughout the United States. Now, I had heard a lot of Rush Limbaugh in my life, a lot of Glenn Beck, a lot of Tim Ferriss, a lot of Gary Vaynerchuk, a lot of the big names, and I have been a production person. I ran an entertainment company, so I've done a lot of audio production. And I realized going into it how hard it was going to be yeah. because I've been up and close to it. But I can't tell you how many people have listened to our podcast 
and have told me that they tried to produce a daily podcast for about four days in a row. Maybe. And then they ran out of things to think about or talk about right. because they weren't aware of the level <laughs> of preparation needed. And so I think it's, it's, it's really hard when you don't know. And that's what I love about your book, Soft Selling in a Hard World. Everybody needs to own a copy of it because you break down the science of how to sit down with the prospect and build rapport. And it's very specific about what questions to ask. You break down how to listen intently. Then you explain how to find their problems how to find their needs. Then you, you teach how to solve the problems, how to support it by facts. The book is so linear, and it breaks it down where I think the world looks at people who are great at sales and says, yeah, that, that's probably natural. It's natural, natural talent. But it's not it. natural. It's a system. And, and, Jerry, we work with hundreds of business owners all over this great country, and we often find that many of them seem scared of making sales calls. What would you say to somebody out there listening right now who is an entrepreneur or who, or who wants to be, who's afraid of picking up the phone and making sales calls? Well, I have told them often when I sit down with management, and I say, look, you have a right to be scared because poor selling skills down line are a message to your market. It's your message to the market, and it is a waste of your money, and you trash the market as you go. And no business and no person likes rejection. The real problem is that all salespeople, and I stress all, I include owners and managers here, can see the upside of every possible transaction. Quote, this could mean $10,000 to my company. And they also sense the downside, no sale, wasted time, expense, and they don't have the skills they need to control the downside and weight the transaction in their favor. Most of the time, they don't even know such skills exist. And they often confuse personal magnetism with selling skills and a signed contract with being liked. Neither of those is true. What is true is that buyers would buy from a donkey if he could solve their problem. Chuck, that's why I've done so well. People are buying from the donkey. Yeah, we'll use that word. That's, that's a good <laughs> right. word to use. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Not the other one. <laughs> uh, no, in, uh, Chuck, Chuck, no, quite, seriously. No, only I can self-deprecate myself. That oh, was, sorry, yeah. that, that's you defer, deprecating <laughs> that's on just, me. That's just mean, isn't right. it? <laughs> now, in your, in your mind, Jerry, why does it seem like so many business owners are scared of rejection when it comes to sales? That, that fear, they fear the word no so much. Why? Because the real process is unknown to them. They are walking into a situation thinking, I have a good product, but they don't know one thing about the client personally and very little about the client's business. So what would you say to a business owner? I see this all the time. They want to delegate their sales to an employee without actually using the script themselves first. Like they want to delegate the sales process to an employee when they personally have not used the system and or created a system, that they want to, the owner wants to delegate their sales to an employee without them actually first creating and using the proven systems. What would you say? Well, to be, not to be cute, but, you know, I've run up against this quite often. I just say, look, you're an idiot. <laughs> because if you owned a major sports team, you wouldn't put a player on the field just because you liked him or her. You'd insist on training and practice and lots of it. Managing salespeople is one of the most difficult aspects of running a business. I mean, I've been in business since I was 17 years old. I'm now 83, so you can count it up. Partly because salespeople take their cue from management, and many managers are not themselves trained. We've often trained salespeople where the managers would not come into the room with them, and so the salespeople ended up knowing more about sales than the managers did, which caused conflicts, you know, in sales meeting because the people are going, whoa, 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 wait a minute, and the manager's going, this is, no, this is what we're going to do. The more years involved they are with their product or service, the shallower the presentation becomes. The senior salesperson is often the worst person to teach others down the line. They're often product-oriented, make a few new calls, and sell to their old connections. So they don't like being told they don't know what they're doing. Business has changed now, and businesses that keep on selling the same way will eventually fall behind.
You know, Jerry, in, in uh, uh, Soft Selling in a Hard World, you wrote a statement that blew my mind uh, the first time I read it, and, and I and just kept reading it again and again. It says, there are only three ways to make exceptional money. To work in a place nobody wants to be, that's one. To work in a place where nobody wants to be, that's one. If you're writing this down, Thrive Nation. To work in a place where nobody wants to be. Two, to perform work nobody else wants to do. Or three, to do work that nobody else can do. So as we're, as we're kind of thinking about that, uh, Chuff, I DJ'd hell gigs at the Holiday Inn Select, Jerry. I was a disc jockey seven days a week at the Holiday Inn Select for impersonators. So one, I was doing work in a place <laughs> no one wanted to do it. Two, I was doing work that nobody else wanted to do because no one else wanted to be a DJ seven nights a week for impersonators who pretended to be Neil Diamond <laughs> and Michael Jackson. And then three, I did work that nobody else could do because who knows how to host four shows in a row that are exactly the same, saying exactly the same jokes and pretending like you care. While bringing the heat. Every single, every single time, Jerry, people would pour in. I'd say, folks, welcome to the Incredible Holiday in Select. You guys are in for a treat. We've got Neil Diamond in the flesh. And everyone's going, woo. And, you know, and I had to tee it up every time. I was like, is Ed McMahon. I mean, so there's, it's so <laughs> true. That is such a true statement. So I ask you, Thrive Nation. How are you going to get rich? Now, you have to perform work that no one else wants to do, to perform work no one else can do, or to work at a place nobody else wants to be. Jerry, talk to us about the importance of facing the reality that these are the only three ways to get rich unless you're a unicorn example. Yes, or, or a drug dealer. <laughs> yeah. Or, or a liquor distributor or I'm something. Gonna, I'm going to write that down. Hey. These, are the financial, these are the financial conditions we all cope with daily. Uh, this book is about dealing with the second and third ways, doing what no one else wants to do and what no one else can do. As you have said, people are scared of selling, and many don't have the skills to close deals. Learning to sell well allows you to bravely meet both of those conditions where you both want to and can do. Jerry, I love when you write in your book, you say, this book is about mechanics. I'll preach it. It is designed from the street up tactics, not strategy. You won't find any magic here. There is none. There's no underlying motivation or belief. Here's, here's my favorite part. It says, it isn't about something larger than yourself. You don't have to believe in it to make it pay. You don't even have to believe in yourself. You just have to use mechanics. Jerry, I, I, I want to pile on there, Chuck, because when I was selling commercial real estate, I didn't care about commercial real estate. Yeah. I would say the vast majority of the business ventures that I'm involved in right now are in industries and things that I am 100% dispassionate about. But, my friend, why is great selling really just about mastering the mechanics of sales? Well, done well. Selling is a profession. And learning a profession isn't something that happens naturally or in a vacuum. It takes an awareness of errors and learning from those errors and correcting the errors, and in doing so, you eventually learn the profession. Persuasion as a profession is no different. It requires attention, troubleshooting, and practice. Jerry, I think that you're, it, it seems so uh, simple. You almost feel like, is that it? Is that it? No, but no, listen, it's not Thrive Nation. It's not a one-time event. It's a process. Right. And so... Chup, we have our sales meetings every single week at Thrive, every yeah. Tuesday, Jerry. Because of you and your book, Jerry, you, you caused this problem. We train our team every single week, <laughs> and in that meeting, we record the calls, yep. and we play back the calls of actual sales presentations. While, we watch actual videos. Yeah, and while reading the script at the same time. And while the actual salespeople, Jerry, are in the room. So the salespeople Weird. actually get to watch themselves physically presenting on video and on audio every single week. And we do it every week. Jerry, for somebody out there that wants to do sales training like one time, why does it require ongoing training? Could you share that? Why does sales require ongoing practice? For the same reason that football players have to practice uh, in every Saturday or in, and several times during the week in order to stay sharp, there are only so many responses that are available to the to the buyer, both in role plays and, and in reality. And when you hear them enough times, you go, I know, how to, I know what to do with this. So it takes a surprise 
out of the transaction for the seller, uh, and you just get you just get better and better. And and I have to say, having your sales meeting once a week and doing role plays, I did that with the, I owned a brokerage in Telluride, Colorado for 30 years, and. And I role played my people every Monday morning at seven thirty, much to everybody's pain and yes. And we control thirty percent of the total market, two of us. And so it, it's one of those nice. things where you go, when this comes to this, this is what you do, this is what you do. You run down you you know, you, you go for the long pass or you go for the short uh, the short out or whatever. So it's uh, practice and all of that is very is a very serious and rewarding activity for the business owner. So Jerry, can you explain to the listeners why you believe that sales is that that soft sales is a learned skill? Well, why do you believe that? Well, because it doesn't come naturally to us. For thirty years, we taught a course in unnatural acts. And for because the stuff doesn't is just not a natural response, it is a learned response. So for the soft sell, one has to put away the ego and let the buyer do the work. Well, believe it or not, it is very difficult for people to allow the buyer to do the work. We live in a culture that tells us we sellers are the center of the universe, and to sell well, one has to allow and encourage the buyer to be the center of his or own universe. Mm. Salespeople, salespeople should talk more than 40% of the time. The buyer should talk 60% of the time. Great sales, salespeople are all above average listeners. When we taught people to do uh, shortlist presentations in front of committees and buying groups and so on, we taught them how to how to give a mission statement, open with a probe, and then sit back and watch the action, rather than talk and talk and talk and 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 do slide after slide and uh, get into uh, um, slide depth. So that this is we need to teach this. We basically we did a course in civilized conversation, which is allow those people to do the work. I love it. I, I love it. I, I totally believe in the rule of conversational generosity. Let the prospect, let the buyer talk the majority of the time. Now, Jerry, uh, there's another knowledge bomb from your book that I highlighted and underlined multiple times. And it read, if you have a world-class idea and you want to give it away for the good of humanity, you will have to sell the concept. And if you can't s- sell it, you'll be stuck with your idea. Poorer for your brilliant brilliance and generosity. It seems unfair, but even freebies must be delivered with a certain salesmanship or the receiver does not perceive the true value of the gift. Jerry, why do so many people push back on the idea of learning how to sell effectively and resort to saying dumb things like, this product is so good, it will sell itself? Well, because they love this illusion, There's a, it is a cultural thing in my estimation. It is maybe 2% of the time it's true that something will sell itself. But if your stuff sells itself, and it's not really selling, it is order-taking. We all love the idea of the financial miracle, winning the lottery or unexpected inheritance from a rich aunt. And we're all looking for the magic bullet, whether it's weight loss or closing deals. Those are myths, too, and they're fun, but selling is a skill. There are no shortcuts to getting good at it and no quick fixes. It may, not, it may not be the fun you're looking for, but the profession is very lucrative. The highest paid people in our culture are salespeople. I agree. I agree with that. I agree with that, and I think that there are many, there's many, many people out there that want to go and do the marketplace – and they want to just state, my product is the best, therefore it's going to sell itself. And Jerry, in your book, you write, puffery is hot air. Webster's definition, Webster's, Webster's uh, dictionary defines it as flattery, publicity, exaggerated commendation, especially for p- promotional purposes. In selling, it is claims that are unproven as stated. Typically, puffery words and phrases are, we're number one, we're the best in our business. Save big money. A lot. 
high profits and the fastest, etc. Can you explain for our listeners the profound difference between attempting to sell using puffery versus attempting to sell using representation, benefits, and facts? Well, in a downscale market, we buy puffery all the time, but I happen to be in the executive sales training business, and so we were teaching people to sell at the very highest levels, which, of course, also works at the lower levels. The less sophisticated the buyer, the more likely they are to buy puffery. But buyers view puffery as lies. They may not be intentional, but the buyers don't believe them. First, they make all salespeople sound the same. So everybody in your business then sounds the same. And when you get killed on a price negotiation, you have no defense. And second, they set up conflicts with your buyer. I want to ask you this, Jerry. This is not about the sales process, but it's about you, the, the sales wizard. How long did it take you to write that book, Soft Selling in a Hard World, which is the Bible of sales. That thing is amazing. How long did it take you to read that or to write that thing? That thing is awesome. Well, probably around six months. Um, it's, it's a funny story. We don't have time to do it here. Someday when we're sitting over drinks, uh, I'll tell you the funny story about it. Come to you tomorrow. <laughs> but, 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 but it was one of those things. I wrote it as part of a software program I was developing at the time because I had my own get rich scheme about how to build a playbook on a computer. Mm -hmm. And so we were developing that in the very early, early days. And that book was just part of a package of teaching people how to sell using computers. So it was really an ancillary program, an ancillary project, I'm sorry, to this larger idea, which the larger idea failed, but the book was residual out of that, and it's now sold about, I don't know, 80,000 or so. It's been on the market for 30, we figured out the other day, 32 years or something it's been on the market. So uh, it's been backlisted a long time. It's kind of one of those books there that I run into a lot of high-level salespeople that have read the book. Oh, yeah. But it's not a book that everybody... If you're, if, if you're listening to this podcast, you should own the book. But if you're you know, working for a company and you're selling burritos and you have no curiosity about how sales works, you should read the book, but you probably won't because it would require a lot of work and thinking. But that book is awesome, Soft Selling in a Hard World. Um, Jerry, I want to go back now to, to asking you some of these questions um, about specifically the closing move. Can you share with us what the closing move looks like to you? Sure. Actually, the closing move is the last move of the seven selling moves that is explored in, in depth in the book. And in fact, most of the course that we teach or used to teach uh, had to do with covering the seven selling moves. It was took three days. I, it, so it's, it, it just encompasses this entire idea of how to do persuasion from the buyer's point of view. And in selling, this move is called the close. This is, this is the move that scares everybody to death. And, uh, and it's not just you. It is where people go, my God, what do I do now? In selling lore, this is the scariest move. However, this seventh move is the simplest move at all, but only if you have set up your whole meeting from your first words to solve the buyer's problem. The actual words to close can be as simple as, well, how do you see us working together to solve this problem? Or where do you think we should go from here? Or something along those lines, and let the buyer do the work. Now, we often get a comment when we teach this that says, well, they never said yes. Well, they were never required to say yes. It was all assumed that they would say yes, and, and if they answered this question, where would you like to go from here? You don't need yes, no. It just doesn't come to that. You know, with our wedding photography uh, company and then with real estate, uh, people asked me, they would look up Fears and Clark online. And by the way, if you're out there at Thrive Nation, take the challenge, type in Fears, F-E-A-R-S, Clark, and then Canbar, uh, Maurice Canbar, uh, there, Jerry, is the guy who invented Sky Vodka. And after selling Sky Vodka for $600 million, he purchased one-third of downtown Tulsa. And he asked me to list and market his properties for him. 
And people would ask me all the time, Clay, when you're signing all those leases, what did you say to close the deal? How'd you do it? I said, well, I one, I'm using my Jerry Vass moves yeah, here. That's right. So I'm never going to say, well, do you want to go ahead and lease the space? I'd say, well, how much space do you need after you've looked at it? Do you want 12,000 12, square go. feet I'm, or 10? I'm sorry. I stepped on your line, but that's what I was listening for. <laughs> I would say that. And then I would say, now, okay, 12 or 10. Okay, 12. Okay. And then when would you like to move in, ideally? The first or the 15th? Okay, great. And uh, we need a security deposit here. Do you want to do debit card or credit card? Okay. You want to sign right here? And then I would walk in to the office every time. And Braxton was there, and Bueno was there, and Tanya was there, and our team was there. And every time they'd go, did you get the deal? And I'd say, uh, guys, this, guys, this deal was kind of tough. And so they could only pay with a credit card. And I would just <laughs> get a deal every time. I would close every deal. I, I'm not kidding. I went, Jerry, in 2007 when I ran my company, DJ Connection, as a result of your book, Soft Selling in a Hard World. I went the entire year. We booked 4,000 weddings. And of all the appointments we set, I only had one person say no the entire year. Whoa. One, Shannon and Clark. You still remember him? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he shut me down, Jerry. He said everyone in town's using you, so I decided to use somebody else. Well, then go ahead. <laughs> so it was a, it, that move works. Now, Jerry, you write in your book that trickery in closing is like trickery anywhere else. It, you know, it's short lived. What do you mean by this? I mean, the, the people teach and. I won't drop names, but you know who they are. Who say, well, there's the puppy dog clothes, and there's the this kind of clothes, and there's this reverse clothes, and there's <laughs> and I'm going, no, that that's bullish. I'm sorry, that that is that is not right because it, it takes away from the buyer's attention. The buyer hates that kind of stuff because they know all of these tricks. And so because they know the tricks, the tricks fall flat, and it just tries to, and it just turns the seller into this shuck and jive guy. Instead of being somebody that you would want to do business to, you go, well, if he'll shuck and jive me here in this transaction, what hold, what's he hold for me down line um, when we're in a serious business? So um, that, that's why trickery doesn't work very well. And if you are in, in, in low in low, low, low street sales, pots and pans and that sort of thing, perhaps you can get away with it. But if you're going to be a legitimate professional salesperson, don't use trickery. I love the phrase shuck and jive. Chup, Chup, I'm going to begin using shuck and jive and shenanigans as words on the show more often. I, I agree. I don't Hold know me why accountable. Why have I not said shuck and jive for a you're, long time? You're practicing shenanigans, and you need to cut it out. Jerry has a better master of the English language than I have. That's that's the whole issue I have here. Now, Jerry, I want to brag on Paul Hood, who's on the show today. Uh, Paul and his company, hoodcpas.com, if you're checking it out. By the way, we're number three right now on the iTunes charts. No puffery there, Jerry, in the business section wow, on the really? iTunes Good charts. We're number three out of 530,000 podcasts, according to the Wall Street Journal, in all categories. I'm talking comedy, sports. I'm talking about comedy, sports, business. We are number 26 as of the time of the recording of today's podcast. So Paul's been a sponsor the entire time. And Paul, over there at Hood CPAs, if somebody comes in, and they meet with you and they do a consultation. You have multiple packages that the customer can choose from. Can you kind of explain, not necessarily all the specifics, but about the idea of having multiple packages and just letting the, the customer choose the options when you go for the close? You bet. And one of the reasons we did that, it kind of ties in with Jerry's book, is uh, Law of Clarity, where he says if you can't explain uh, your product to a 10-year-old, then you don't know your product very well. You're not a very good salesman. And so what we have is we basically try to break it down into to three uh, decisions. And also so that they that it's not a decision between yes and no. It's a decision between which of the three do they want. And and they go from a very basic, comprehensive, where we're, we're just doing some consulting type work and meeting with them once a month to the next style. Maybe we if it's a business, we're doing accounting plus all the consulting. The third one would be if we're doing payroll and accounting and consulting. But it's it's it breaks it down to where all right, uh, Mr. Potential Client, which of these three do you want? Which best fits your your needs? It, that's it, he's, we're doing textbook the soft selling close. That's right. you know, now, Chup, I want to teach Jerry a word here on this next question. Jerry, you taught you've you've brought us back to shuck and jive and oh, shenanigans. Yeah. yeah. 
So I'm going to give you a word. Here it goes. I'm a huge New England Patriots fan, and the word I would like to teach you today is wicked awesome. Wicked. <laughs> wicked awesome. And that's one word. And if you if you if anything is great in Boston, it's wicked awesome. It's so, not hyphenated. It's so just Jerry, wicked awesome. So, Jerry, I would like for you to break down <laughs> your wicked awesome bonus move on page 119 of soft selling in a hard world. You write about this wicked awesome move called cross-selling. What is cross-selling all about, and why is it so wicked awesome important? Well, it's wicked awesome important because many, if not most, salespeople have several things to sell. And after the buyer's first agreement, because you're going to be closing incrementally, and after the first agreement, the salesperson now has a proven performer in the buyer and, and uh, must move on to the second and third sale and so on. Some businesses can't even survive without cross-sells, and successful cross-selling cuts across the cost of sales and increases profits, and you, you, you run into it very often when you buy something and you say you want an extended warranty with that or you fries with that burger, uh, you need some add-on accessories for that car. Well, that's where the real profit comes. And so add-on sales really is the profit center for many of these businesses and a way to survival for them. You know, Best Buy... The cost always starts with a probe, too, by the way. always starts with a question. And so you can just continue on. I remember I was trained early on and I was selling mutual funds in one of my many careers. And... I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know a damn thing about mutual funds. I didn't know anything about that business, but I was taught how to sell it, and I went out, and I just kept selling until I ran out of things to sell. I finally had to shrug my shoulders and say, well, I, that's it for me. I'm done. I don't, I don't have anything else left. So um, cross-selling is a, and can be pretty high adventure, particularly on high-end on high-end stuff like high-end real estate. I'm talking to business buildings and that sort of thing. I taught that for 30 years. And, uh, and where these people are making a million and a half, two million, three million dollars per sale, uh, and they practiced all the time, all the time. And when they practiced, it was serious, man, because there was serious money involved. And these were serious, bright, educated people, and it, they were wonderful to teach. Now, this is this is something I wanna I wanna hammer home on here because Chup, this great selling doesn't, as Jerry has mentioned in his book and then on today's podcast, it, great salespeople don't even look like they're selling, Paul. Right. They just, it it, it just it's happening. And I'll never forget this, Jerry. I called the book a cruise with Karen Wheelock, and if you're out there and you know Karen Wheelock. Say that Clay Clark is bragging on her because she was good. And if you are Karen Wheelock, Clay Clark is bragging on her. Oh, you're, you're the best, Karen <laughs> Wheelock. So I, I, I went to book a cruise, you know, and Karen says, well, great. Yeah, and I said, how much are the cruises? And Karen said to me, this is the first cruise I went on. I insisted on being the cheapest price possible. And I had a small boat, got motion sickness the entire time. So the second time I call and I said, Karen, how much do you charge? How much would it be? And she says, Clay, do you... Uh, let me ask you, what, what are you looking to do here? What's the big occasion? And I tell her, and she's, oh, oh, so you're going to surprise her? Oh, really? Wow. So let me ask you this. What are some of her favorite activities? Next thing you know, she's got the probing questions going on. Next thing you know, Jerry, she booked an appointment. She got me to commit, not to buying something, but commit to the appointment within 72 hours, you know, kind of within that window of time when I'm still interested. I met with her, and she just continued asking me, well, if you're going to be here, don't you want to at least have like a balcony or don't you want to get this, you know, room service or what about tickets to that? Have you thought about a catamaran tour? And Jerry, somehow that $1,000 cruise, I feel like that $1,000 per person cruise turned out to be about $5,000 per person, but it was right. wicked awesome. Mm. It was really good. So the cross sell, <laughs> I mean, that is, woo. And one thing, Jerry, that you've, you've talked about is that during your years working with thousands of salespeople, You've noticed that salespeople will instantly freeze up and seem to almost have kind of like a, a panic attack. I've seen it. You've seen it. It's a, a salesperson has almost like an anxiety, immediate panic attack. It's like their brain shuts off as soon as a buyer inserts any objections whatsoever. 
Why is it that most salespeople need to learn to overcome objections? Well, quite frankly, if you can figure out what the problem is in the objection, you're about halfway to an answer just on that part without doing anything. So when you hear an objection, the first thing you have to do is figure out what the real objection is. English is a very complex language, and what you think you heard and what the buyer really is saying can be quite different. So the first move is to ask a question, something simple as, why is that, or help me understand why you say that, or what is going on here, etc. We're now assuming salespeople have playbooks, so they will have practiced the answer to this objection. But it takes practice, and and uh, you're you're on the money, having people practice, particularly in front of uh, recording devices, cameras, and so on, because people cannot simply believe how bad they are until they see themselves <laughs> right. on the camera. So true. Right. It's just it's just humiliating, and so when <laughs> I mean I watch myself on camera and I just hang my head and cry. <laughs> <laughs> now, Jerry. You've written much about how salespeople can truly make a fortune if they understand that the profits are in solving the problems. I repeat, Chubb, the profits are in solving the problems. Chubb, oh, yeah. I'm not sure if I'm communicating. It, maybe my mic is cutting out. You say the problems, I mean, are... the problems are in solving problems. <laughs> ah. Chubb, Chubb are you, do you get what I'm saying? The profits. Uh, let, me, let me try it in Spanish. El pro- profits. El profito. Uh, el profito uh, are in, uh, in el solving el problemo. Right. So, <laughs> all right. So, can you talk to us about what you mean by that? Sure. When we circle back to the top of our talk today, selling well is problem solving. When selling to executives, there are really seven business problems that seem to be universal, which we discovered. In, in, our, uh, in learning from our students. They're outlined in detail in my other book, Soft Selling to Executives, and they pop up over and over again. They are uh, to acquire and manage capital, acquire and manage people, find and fill markets, meet and exceed the competition, improve quality and lower costs of production, maintain sufficient and predictable cash flow, overhead, uh, and maintain control and predictable overhead. When you're selling into this stuff at the business level, life goes pretty well. I mean, it's just that because people are not going to argue with you, you say, look, we're here to help you pick one, cut your overhead or meet or exceed the competition or find and fill a new market or acquire and manage your people or, uh, or, or, your, or your finances. Or, um, so when you hit the business level uh, for um, up, uh, upscale clients, that's where the money is. And, you don't, and really selling becomes consulting at that point where you, where you really are genuinely bringing value, true value, to your client. I want to make sure that the listeners get a specific example of this, okay? So, uh, Jerry, if somebody out there listens to our podcast and they reach out to us for business coaching, here are just some of the problems that we can solve, and I'll just kind of list them out. And, and Paul, you can chime in if there's something I'm, I'm missing out on. But Hey, I got a quote here. It's a business guru. If you've got a problem, you'll all solve it. Check out the moves. Well, my DJ revolves it. Thank you for quoting Vanilla Ice, the early 90s rapper. <laughs> business <there>. guru. <laughs> I, I did, I, Jerry, are you a big fan of Vanilla Ice? Were you a big fan of the early 90s rapper Vanilla Ice? Yes, uh-huh. Okay. Nice. <laughs> there, there he is. So this is the thing, though. Uh, people come, say, what do you guys do? Well, we do all the search engine. So what's the problem we're solving? How do you get to the top of Google? So we're right. getting you to the top of Google. Uh, we help you make a workflow. Well, what problem does that solve? It helps you create time freedom. Uh, Paul, sales scripting. What problem does it help for you when, when our organization helps you with sales scripting? How, how, how does that help you, Paul? Well, it helps by creating a duplicatable system that can be scaled. Uh, so that it's all, not all dependent upon the top salesperson, me. 
videography. What problem does that solve, Eric, for, uh, video, for, for our listeners out there? Yeah, we're, we're oftentimes educating the customer on who we are, what we sell, and we're showing them happy previous clients and testimonial videos as well. A lot of our clients can't afford a videographer. Right. They can't do it. So we do the videography, the photography, the web development, the sales scripting, but we have to think about it in terms of the buyer. What are the problems we're solving for you? And the problem for you, the average buyer, is you have a small business, and you don't have the ability to, you don't have the money to hire a full-time videographer and a full-time photographer and a full-time web developer and a consultant to make it all happen. And so for $1,700 a month, month to month, you know, for less money than it costs to hire a $10 per hour employee, yeah. you get all that stuff. And so that's, that's the, the but it, I think, Jerry, a lot of us, we can become so experts of what we're, we can become such an expert and a guru of our industry that we can't explain it to anybody. And that's why I love the chapter of your book where you talk about the importance of positive self-talk and really sharing with your, yourself on an, on an ongoing basis this positive, intentional self-talk and coaching yourself up. So when you head into the presentation, you're saying, you know, I can do this. I've got it. I've prepared. I already did I know this. what I'm doing. Mm. Jerry, can you talk to us about the importance of being intentional about what you say to yourself as a salesperson? Yes. Yes. Because all of us, as, I mean, I have never met anybody who sold who didn't have fear at some level. And, um, I mean, I've walked in many, many boardrooms um, to sell our services, and, and I knew exactly what I was going to do and how to control it because I had studied it and written a couple of books about it and all of that. But even then, I, you know, I mean, it's pretty easy to get tense in those things. If you when it goes out of control, when when suddenly the answer to a to a question ends up over in left field someplace, you, you're looking at it and going, "What the hell do I do now?" Right. So it's easy for us to talk ourselves out of selling when all we can see is the stress of it, preparation, knowing exactly where you're going and what you're where you're taking the buyer can change that. The, there are many more problems than problem solvers. So you, it's kind of incumbent on the salesperson to keep their eye on the problem. What is the problem? You can continue to go, what is the problem? Um, and and if you know what the problems are when you walk in, I mean, I, used, I would open with those. Uh, I would go into uh, the boardrooms of big firms, and my opening shot, I'd just take a look around the room and say, hey there, my name is Jerry Vess, and when your people walk in to sell your services, they don't know what they're doing. And so they have one wreck right after another, often three wrecks before they get to the end of the first sentence. Right. And they go, whoa, because you can prove it. There it is. And they know it. They, somewhere in their heart, they know that I am telling them the truth. And, and let's, let's take the accounting business. 90% of new businesses fail within three years. That would be my opening shot. 90% of businesses fail within three years. So right away, it gets the attention yes. of everybody in the room, and you can prove it. And it's provable, and it's researchable, and it's all there, and 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 it scales down or up depending on your perspective. It scales up to up to that ten percent is remaining, but it's like half fail within the first year, and there's some long term ratio that goes like that. So and more fail within the second year, but by the third year, it's only ten percent left. And and it's pretty easy once you're aware of it. It's pretty easy to watch it happen in real time. And somewhere in your heart of hearts, you know it's true. Okay. So when you're a, when you have a reputation as a problem solver, the opportunities just naturally flow your way. It becomes it isn't effortless, but it's certainly at a greatly reduced effort. Sales ma salespeople and managers worry a lot about losing clients. I'll tell you, when you solve a client's problem, you can't get rid of them. I mean, they stick to you like glue. This is so true. If you're out there, uh, there's one gentleman that I met here about uh, two months ago, Paul, at a conference. And he said to me, he says, I am a, this guy was in Florida, okay, in Florida. I won't give any more details. I just say he's in Florida. And he said, what I do 
is I'm a social media marketer, Paul. And I said, that's cool. So what kind of problems do you solve for your ideal and likely buyers? What, what, what kind of problems do you solve? You know? And he says, well, what I do is I generate leads. And then I said, do you? That was my question. <laughs> yeah. Do you? Do you? Is and, it provable? <laughs> and he said, well, 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 yeah. I said, so it's like, a, how does that work? He says, well, you pay up front for the first three months. You got to prepay for the first three months. And it was a huge fee, Jerry. It was like $6,000 or something. And I said, okay. And then what happens? He goes, well, then if you want to cancel, you can after like the third month. Because it's only like 1000 a month after the first three months, the big upfront fee. And the guy, I said, well, could you show me an example of maybe a client you've ever worked with where they get leads, maybe just one? And he's like, well, uh, Paul, there's kind of too many to name, you know? I mean, it's got a lot of them, really. And Jerry, <laughs> he's fishing around. And I wasn't trying to, I was trying to help the guy. And then he pulls me aside at our workshop and he goes, I got to be honest with you. I've never actually done this for people before. And I said, well, dude, that, that move doesn't work. What you should say is, hey, I'm a social media marketer. I believe in my product. And you'd be my first client. And so I'm going to do your first month for free. And then if you're happy, then I'll charge you this much, this much per month. But you have to be uh, direct and honest. you got to use facts. But you also have to get in front of the decision maker or you're not going to have a conversation anyway. <laughs> so the decision maker... Uh, Paul, if someone's trying to go to Hood CPAs, uh, they go to hoodcpas.com, they listen to our podcast, uh, and they show up at your office. The chances of, of getting to you, um, unless they have an appointment, are pretty pretty slim, probably none. Yeah, virtually none. Yes. Because you are a decision maker. Therefore, you've set up systems in your life and processes to make yourself unreachable. Uh, so Jerry wrote in his book here, he said, Jerry, you, you write, in your book... Uh, the decision maker is often as elusive as true love. Can you explain this, Jerry, why the decision makers like Paul are always so elusive? Because they hate salespeople. Because salespeople waste their time. And our view is that you should be able to go in, make a complicated presentation, close the deal, and be gone at the executive level in 15 minutes. So that means that everything is quantified, it is provable, there it is, you have a lead, you got a story. The problem here is, is that salespeople spend a lot of time talking into a receptive ear, which often has no decision-making responsibility. It's because salespeople often prefer to meet someone at a lower level who's more interested in the features of what you sell. And salespeople are often intimidated by executives who are interested only in benefits. What is in this for me, for my business? That's all they're interested in. And so that would then dictate that you would walk in and, and say, my business is to increase your bottom line, your net profits, but 2% annually. That's what we do. Well, we can discuss that, you know, and because we're talking the executive language. So people are, are, they don't understand that executives are not interested particularly in features. That's for the people down line, the kind of computer or the, or, or the, uh, the app that they're using or some relationship that they have with them. That, that's not what they're talking. They're talking about the wrong stuff. Once you know what your product or service does for buyers and how you impact their company, you are way, way less likely to be intimidated or willing to waste time with someone who can't say yes. It is, Here's a question. Yeah. How, is, how are decisions like this when you're talking to anybody in the firm? I mean, you're just, I mean you are talking to the receptionist or you're talking to... The janitor, you yep. ask him a question. How are decisions like this made inside this firm? I had a really good person and today that asked me that, Jerry, a very skilled person. And for our Christmas party, it's going to be $55 a head, you know, this year for the party. Every year, Jerry, it always is going up. Inflation, you know, it's always going up there. This year, it's $55 sure. a head. We have a staff all in between Z and I. There'll probably be 400, uh, getting closer to 500 people there this year. There's a lot of people. And if you take four or 500 times 55, that's a large number. And so a person asked me today, they said, how are decisions made for you guys, for your holiday party within Thrive? How do you do that? And I said, well, uh, my wife decides the budget 
for the party. That's what my wife does. She decides that, and so you got to talk to her. And I think it's so important because if you would have been pitching to me, I don't care how good the pitch is, even if I would have loved it, Jerry, I don't have the budget authority within our organization. We decided that 18 years ago that my wife would make all final decisions on that holiday party because I always want to swag it out and you know spend money on things we shouldn't be buying. And Vanessa is very good with the budget. And so that's such a wise question. Ask people, who is the decision maker? How are decisions often made? Jerry, that is so important. Well, if you ask them who the decision maker is, they're going to say that's me. That's me. And so you have to come. You have to come in a side door a side on door. that. How are decisions made? My view is, and in, in, in asking questions and probes, you start every one of them with how. I love it. Everyone. And once once you've mastered how, you can move on to some other things like maybe what and who. <laughs> how is so good. <laughs> it's, it's so good. Uh, okay. So anytime you ask somebody, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not. I don't mean to correct you, but this is this is what I do. Yeah. Um, when you when you go, how are decisions made inside the company? You're going to get a different answer from who is the decision maker. Well, I'll say this. Okay? I'll say this. I'm not going to argue with the sales wizard. I want to make sure we get this. The, the the reason why we're doing this podcast and this next question I have for you, Jerry, ties into this, is once you've read your book, right? Three times, okay? Once I've read the book three times, once you've read your own book, Jerry, 400 times, you have to make a playbook then, and you have to write down the specific questions because you just pointed out you would prefer to ask how, which is a great question. And the thing is, off the cuff is a bad way to go. The pros prepare. they got to have a playbook. So you and I are having a conversation here, but you're going to, after you've read that book, and you've outlined and you've taken notes, you have to make an actual playbook because you and I both know that the devil's in the details. Can you explain what it means for salespeople to truly make a sales playbook? Right. Well, it's, it's on a basic simple theory that if you can't write it, you can't do it. Self-selling is an action plan, and writing comes first, then practice on the street. The playbook is a working document. It changes over time as your business, your products, your services, your competition all change right in front of your eyes. So after each call, make notes of what didn't work and what you would change and schedule regular reviews of your playbook uh, for review and upgrading because it's you know life is a continuous upgrade path here. <laughs> right. It becomes an archive of the best of what you do. It's also an excellent teaching tool if you're called on to train new hires. So we have found that it becomes a, a, a almost a well, it's not priceless, but it is <laughs> it is very pricey in the in the sense that it keeps you from making. Uh, there's many bad moves in a in a live presentation. Oh, it's so good when you take the time to do this. It's so good. Thrive Nation, take the time to make a sales book. Now, Jerry, why do you think that most people never do take the time to make their sales playbook? You know, they, they, none of our listeners, but other people on other planets, other ch- parallel universes, other or... countries, not our country, yeah, no, no. other planetary systems, they will listen to a podcast like this, and then they won't actually make the sales playbook. What's going on, Jerry? Why won't people ever take the time out to make the playbooks? Well, they don't understand, this is my assessment, they don't understand the importance of the act of the creation and design stage. Actually, what happens is people learn a great deal about their own business in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the act of putting down the words and what they think they say. And so what you think you say, when you write it down, it changes in front of your eyes. Yes. Um, I mean, it's like studying for a play where you you read the words and you say the words and do the words over and over and over on the script. And then one day they change right in front of your eyes because you go, oh, I got it. So that's what a playbook does. It allows you to get it. And when building it, you know, when you're going to eliminate puffery and develop proof statements and quantify your benefits and find the unique benefits that you sell and, and uh, 
design a mission statement for both your firm and the upcoming call. So, and you're going to develop each of the seven selling moves, which you've only touched on briefly here, as explained in, in the book. Because, and that is those seven selling moves. It's really the, the, the central theme of our three-day, you know, really hard selling course because we end up developing a, the selling book if we did in class and then sent them home to do homework. And in, and there was two or three hours of homework uh, every night uh, wow. in order to work on the playbook. So it is, it is a, it's kind of a pain to do. It is time consuming and it will tax your brain because you have to shift your thinking over to how does the buyer think about this? We know what we think about it. Right. How do they think about it? So, and you will eventually develop a return on investment for the buyer of your services or your products delivered. So, the the ROI at the at the at the, at the higher end of selling when you're selling larger uh, ticket stuff. The return on investment becomes a very critical thing. We can say, we can say, look, you're going to give me a dollar, and I'm going to give you ten dollars back within ninety days. Well, I mean that takes away that takes care of a whole lot of selling problems right there. And you can prove right. if you can prove that, which we could in our case. Um, we can, you say you know it, it becomes. I want to this this. These final two questions, I am very, very, very passionate, Chef, about this next question because I falsely believed, Jerry, for a decade previous to knowing you, from age 18 to about age 20, I guess it's age 17 to age 27, age 26, somewhere in that time frame, I believed that sales was about motivation. So I would send my team to sales conferences all the time. And I would go to these motivational conferences. Now, let me tell you the kinds of things they would teach. And when I took notes, Jerry, I'm a note taker. These are the kinds of things they would write down. They would say, everyone stand up right now and say right now, if I can conceive it, I can achieve it. And they bounce the beach ball. <laughs> the, music, the music's playing. And they're saying, everybody now. And everyone's yelling. They'll have you stand up on a chair and say, I can't sell. And they would talk to you about feeling it and they would talk about aligning your vision chup with your goals oh, yeah. and they would talk about the power of discovering the infinite knowledge that could you could find by in tapping into the universal knowledge of course they would never call it god but it became almost like a religion jerry there's all this motivation sure. and i went to one conference and i met these people and i thought why are all of the jackasses here and then i thought to myself <laughs> Why am I here? And then I realized oh. I also was a jackass, and I was going to the Jackass Festival, and I kind of liked it for the first four or five times because it was a jackass festival. But over time, I realized all of those people were always looking for the new get-rich-quick move. Their companies weren't working, and things were going to hell because none of them could sell well. So if I'm out there saying, okay, I've been to all those conferences, I've been to all those woo-woo things, I've walked on hot calls... I've watched all the motivational. Jerry, you've seen it. All the videos. I've done trust falls with my team. I've gone to <laughs> ropes courses. Hot calls. I'd like to get your thoughts on how salespeople can overcome their fears and the best way to train your team. Well, it sounds to me like you have much of this, uh, this ball of wax uh, well under control. But it, it, it reminds me of the thing, the question about, they asked the violin player, um, the violin player asked, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? And the answer is practice, practice, practice. Mm. And, and the sales is the same way, and it is not a glorious, it is not a glorious motivational driven craft anymore. You can be a motivated football player it doesn't keep you from getting your head knocked off out there. And so I feel the same way. If you know how to defend yourself with, with knowledge, then you can defend yourself in, in every circumstance that you run into, except earthquake and, and uh, bombing. But you, you're never afraid. 
I I was terrified for years, and I've been selling for God 150 years. Fear <laughs> doesn't exist well in the face of extensive preparation. It just doesn't. And and the way you work your people, and I think it's the way you're working them, which right. is. You find a buddy and you role play every presentation. You don't wait for a perfect presentation. You just start using the skills and perfect them as you go along because it is a lifetime skill. It isn't something you're going to do for a year and then leave because if you go for a year and leave and you know your business, you're going to make yourself 100,000, 150,000 and and nothing makes you feel quite as good as having a nice fat bank account. And and there's no time like the present to begin to do that. So do it now and I absolutely agree with the motivational um, ideas, because I think people do need motivation, and particularly people who work alone, they get bummed, they get disappointed, and they get disappointed greatly in sales because they don't have a skill to close deals that are walking in their door every single day, and those people turn around and walk out. Uh, I owned a real estate brokerage in in the mountains, and I trained my people people would come in and say, well, we want to see what's for sale. And I had to train my people to say, well, come back to my office and sit down here and talk to me about that. And the first question from our side was, what would you like the real estate to do for you? Mm. And that then began to greatly narrow the inventory about what you were going to talk about. Right, And you just went along that whole line, and you qualified, 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 until finally it narrowed it down to where you had, well, I got two or three properties that we could look at that'll do what you want. You didn't and guess. So, you didn't guess. You asked those questions. It's so powerful. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, this is you know, out of my experience of how to have it as a trades and and some of them worked, and some of them didn't. <laughs> I mean, I, I actually I'm a man known for his failures more than his successes. So. Well, I think your biggest failure is agreeing to be on our podcast. That just shows a lack of judgment there. But thank you so much for making one more uh, <laughs> poor decision. I agree. All right, so now far this has been miserable. It's been miserable. <laughs> okay, well, Jerry, I have a final question here for you. Um, you've literally worked with thousands of salespeople all over the world. Why do you believe that most people just try to make things up on the fly as opposed to implementing a proven path? I think a good part of it is laziness. Uh, I mean, there's two things. These are harsh words, but it has to do with laziness because it's work and with a big W, and it's time-consuming and... People often do not even know that there is a proven path other than whatever the senior salespeople told him who, who gave him, gave, uh, gave the, the new boy uh, everything that he knew, which really wasn't very much on how to make the sale happen. Guy's been doing it for 30 years, and so he, has, he is wired. He's the number one guy in the company, and he is wired to accounts that he has been courting for 20 years. And so he, is, he confuses people when they say, let's watch him work. And he goes out and he says, hey, Bob, I'm here to pick up our order for this month or for this year or here to move you over to that other place. And uh, so when do you want to get started? Well, because the trust is already built, it looks really easy. It's very deceptive. Many people do not understand there's an underlying structure to successful human communication and persuasion. And working without a structure or a plan is a design for failure. And in this profession, there's no magic bullet in this profession any or any other one that you can think of or will run into in your lifetime. I think what you just said is, is, is so powerful. There's no magic bullet. There's a proven system. It works. It's called soft selling in a hard world. Uh, Paul, I wanted to see, and Jerry, if you, if, if, if Paul no longer asks uh, political gotcha questions, he no longer asks religious questions, he no longer paints our guests into uh, a corner as one of our proud show sponsors, but he is a real entrepreneur 
with thousands of real customers. He has real employees. Paul, do you have a final question for the Wizard of Sales, Mr. Jerry Vass? Well, yeah, you know, and I, I apologize if this is a selfish question, but oh. um, I would just like from the sales guru out there, Jerry, to uh, if, do you have any advice for me? Because like I say, I'm in the, the wisdom business, and I read uh, a long time ago, I can't remember, look, I read it out, that if you, if you sell somebody, you break rapport, uh, but if you, you uh, educate them, you, you, you build rapport. But then I've got to balance that side of things, the, the hard sell versus um, being not creating too much of a, a wisdom based or, or, you know, like you said, vomiting my product or my wisdom or my knowledge all over them. What kind of advice could you give to me for that middle ground that I've, you know, I've got to educate them somewhat um, in that 40 percent that I speak, um, but I don't want to vomit all, all, all over them, like you said earlier? <sighs> Well, it sounds to me like you're doing it right. I mean, there's always a balance that has to be achieved, and 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 it, there's a balance between advice and persuasion, and knowledge, and experience, and and wisdom. I mean, there's some kind of a balance, and I don't know what that balance is, but I do know that it is there because I mean, in the, what we just did here in this podcast is that I have worked hard to balance advice and wisdom and knowledge that I have gained doing this for most of my adult life because it takes all of it. It's kind of a, the whole magilla, the whole package. So, frankly, I wouldn't worry about it if I were you. I would do what I'm doing if you're successful doing it. I do not believe if if if... You can afford to give away a new car with every sale, and you want to do that, for God's sake, do it. Uh, but if you can't afford that, you're going to have to figure out something else. And so it's one of those things where you go, I don't like to try to change people from what they're doing now if they're successful now. I work with people who are less than successful than, who are less successful than they should be. Mm. Given their talent, their education, their preparation, their time and rank, their education in the market, uh, when they're still losing, then they can use this information to start cleaning up their act and, and getting successful again. Most people have been successful at least once, um, and, but they wandered off. They forgot where the center of the universe was, where the center of the universe is communication with buyers and potential buyers. They forgot that, and they started doing other things. I mean, I've done it. I mean, I had nine man years in a, in a software program because I lost contact with reality, actually. I lost contact with reality. I was going on this $10 million deal that I knew that it was going to be superb and I was going to be rich for life and, and be able to buy myself a good used car. So it was, but I was wrong. I was wrong. And, and because I wandered off from the basics. So I don't think I'm the right guy to ask about what you should do differently. If you're successful doing what you're doing, for God's sake, don't change it. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Now, Jerry, I appreciate you so much for, for taking the time to be on today's uh, uh, show. Where, where, where are you physically uh, located? What state are you in? I am on the beach in North Florida. In North Florida? On, uh, yeah, northeast Florida, 40 miles south of Jacksonville. I'm looking at the beach and the ocean, as the, and, and it is part of uh, my success package, so we say. That and my partner of 25 years, Iris Heron, who actually is a co-author of my, the second book I wrote, which is uh, Soft Selling for Executives, and... Uh, so anyway, it's a, it's a very happy circumstance. Is soft selling in a hard world an imprint for the people that want to get a copy? I've been buying them off of Amazon. Is there a certain place you'd recommend all of our listeners to go to to get a copy of that book? No, Amazon is Amazon is the place that the stuff is bought, and uh, so that that works. Well, Jerry, thank you so much for being on today's podcast. If you see a pale males, the big white moose walking up and down the beach in Jacksonville. That's me. 
because we've been to Jacksonville a few <laughs> times, and I am the most pale man in the history of our planet. So just look away. It's I don't want you to burn your your corneas or anything. And when you see the, I, I, I like reflect light, don't I, Chup? I yeah, mean, it's it's, it's, it's uh, truly <laughs> Casper. Handsome. <laughs> yeah, all right. What, so, what is the scream? Don't look at it. Don't look at it. <laughs> <laughs> That was Jerry Vass right here on the Thrive Time Show on your podcast download. And now with any further ado, three, two, one, boom. Hey, this is Dustin Huff. I'm with Keystone Harbor Marina. Um, we joined Thrive uh, back in January and uh, have been working with these guys for about seven months. Uh, during that time period, we have uh, moved up our Google rank through reviews and SEO processes that we've uh, uh, compiled through these guys. Our leads have gone from about four a week to now 165 a week. So the process works. Uh, I will tell you from experience, once you begin, you have to stay with it. As long as you continually do this week in and week out, month in and month out, you'll continually grow uh, your reviews and you'll also continually grow your revenues. So it's important to stay with it. So this is not a, a, a get rich quick scheme. Uh, I would say stay with it. Google reviews are paramount and content is king. So as long as you stick with it, uh, your revenue will grow and your business will grow. Thanks. The number of new customers that we've had is up 411% over last year. We are Jared and Jennifer Johnson. We own Platinum Pest and Lawn and are located in Owasso, Oklahoma. And we have been working with Thrive for business coaching for almost a year now. Yeah. So, so what we want to do is we want to share some wins with you guys uh, that, that we've had by working with Thrive. Um, first of all, um, we're on the top page of Google now. Okay. Um, I just want to let you know what type of accomplishment this is. Our competition, Orkin, Terminex, they're both $1.3 billion companies. They both have two to 3,000 pages of content um, attached to their website. So to basically go from uh, virtually non-existent on Google to up on the top page is, is really saying something. Um, but that's come by being uh, diligent to the systems that, that Thrive has, um, by, be, by uh, being consistent and diligent on, on doing podcasts um, and staying on top of those podcasts um, to really help uh, with, with getting up on, on uh, uh, with their listing and ranking there with Google. And also, we've been um, trying to get Google reviews, you know, asking our customers for reviews. And now we're the highest rated and most reviewed pest and lawn company in the Tulsa area. And that's really helped with our conversion rate. And the number of new customers that we've had is up 411% over last year. Wait, say, say that again. How much are we up? 411%. Okay. So 411% um, we're up with, with our new customers. Amazing. Right. right. So not only do we have more customers calling in, we're able to close those deals at a much higher rate than we were before. Right now, our closing rate is about 85%, and that's largely uh, due to, uh, first of all, like our Google reviews that we've gotten people really see that our customers are happy, but also we have a script that we follow. And so when customers call in, they get all the information that they need. Uh, that script has been refined time and time again. Uh, it wasn't a one and done deal. We it was a system that we that we followed with Thrive in, in the refining process, and that has obviously um, the 411 percent shows that 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 system works. Yeah. So here's a big one for you. So last week alone, our booking percentage was 91 percent. We actually booked more deals, more new customers last year than we did the first five months. Or I'm sorry, the first we, we booked more deals last week than we did the first five months of last year from before we, we, we worked with Thrive. So again, we booked more deals last week than the first five months of last year. And it's incredible. But, but the reason why we have that success is by implementing uh, the systems that, that Thrive has taught us and, and, and helped us out with. So. Some of those systems that we've implemented are group interviews. That way we've really been able to uh, come up with a really great team. Um, we've created and implemented checklists. That way everything um, gets done and it gets done right. Uh, we, it creates accountability. Uh, we're able to make sure that everything uh, gets done properly, both out in the field and also in our office. Um, and also doing the podcast, like Jared had mentioned, that has really, really contributed to our success. But that, like I said, the diligence and um, consistency and doing those in that system has really, um, really been a, a big blessing in our lives. And also, um, you know, it's really shown that we've gotten the success from following those systems. Yeah. So before working with Thrive, uh, we were basically stuck. Um, really no new growth um, with our with our business um, and we, we were in a rut and we so, didn't know 
Oh, sorry. The last three years, our customer base had pretty much stayed the same. We weren't shrinking, but we weren't really growing either. Yeah, and so we didn't we didn't really know where to go, what to do, uh, how to get out of this rut that we're in. Uh, but Thrive helped us with that. You know, they, they implemented those systems. That they taught us those systems. They taught us the knowledge that we needed um, in order to succeed. Now it's been a grind. Absolutely, it's been a grind this last year. Um, but we're but we're getting those fruits uh, from from that hard work and, and the diligent effort that, that we're able to put into it. Um, so again, we were in a rut. Thrive helped us get out of that rut. Um, and uh, and if you're thinking about um, working with, with, with Thrive, quit thinking about it and just do it. Um, do the action, um, and you'll get the results. It, it will take hard work and discipline, um, but but uh, but that's what it's going to take in order to in order to, to really succeed. So uh, we just want to give a big shout out to Thrive, a big thank you out there to, to Thrive. We wouldn't be where we're at, where we're at now um, without their help. Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Moore. I'm a pediatric dentist. Through our new digital marketing plan, we have seen a market increase in the number of new patients that we're seeing every month, year over year. One month, for example, we went from 110 new patients the previous year to over 180 new patients um, in the same month. And overall, our average is running about 40 to 42 percent increase month over month, year over year. The group of people required to implement our new digital marketing plan is immense, starting with a business coach, videographers, photographers, web designers. Back when I graduated dental school in 1985, nobody advertised. The only marketing that was ethically allowed in everybody's eyes was mouth-to-mouth -mouth marketing. By choosing to use the services, you're choosing to use a proof and turnkey marketing and coaching system that will grow your practice and get you the results that you're looking for. I went to the University of Oklahoma College of Dentistry, graduated in 1983, and then I did my pediatric dental residency at Baylor College of Dentistry from 1983 to 1985. Hello, my name is Charles Kolaw with Kolaw Fitness. Uh, today I want to tell you a little bit about Clay Clark and how I know Clay Clark. Clay Clark has been my business coach since 2017. He's helped us grow from two locations to now six locations. We're planning to do seven locations in seven years and then franchise. And Clay has done a great job of helping us navigate anything that has to do with like running the business, building the systems, the checklists, the workflows, the audits, um, how to, how to um, navigate lease agreements, how to uh, buy property, um, how to uh, work with brokers and builders. This guy is just amazing. He's, he's This kind of guy has worked in every single industry. He's written books with like Lee Crockerell, head of Disney with the 40,000 cast members. Um, he's friends with like Mike Lindell. Um, he does Reawaken America tours where he does these tours all across the country where 10,000 or more people show up to some of these tours on the day-to-day. -day, he does anywhere from uh, about 160 companies. He's at the top. He has a team of uh, business coaches, videographers, and graphic designers and web developers, and they run 160 companies every single week. So think of this guy with a team of business coaches running 160 companies. So in the weekly, he's running 160 companies. Um, every six to eight weeks, he's doing Reawaken America tours. Every six to eight weeks, he's also doing business conferences where 200 people show up, and he teaches people a 13-step proven system that he's done and worked with billionaires, helping them grow their companies. Um, so he's, I've seen guys from startups go from startup to being multimillionaires, um, teaching people how to get time freedom and financial freedom through the system critical thinking, document creation, um, making it, putting it into, uh, or organizing everything in their head to building it into a, a franchisable, scalable business. Like one of his businesses has like 500 franchises. That's just one of the companies or brands that he works with. So amazing guy, Elon Musk kind, kind of like smart guy. Um, he kind of comes off sometimes as socially awkward, but he's so brilliant and he's taught me so much. When I say that, like, like, Clay is like, he doesn't care what people think when you're talking to him. He cares about where you're going in your life and where he can get you to go. Um, and uh, that's what I like him most about him. He's like, he's like a, a good coach. A coach isn't just making you feel good all the time. A coach is actually helping you get to the best you. And Clay has been an amazing business coach. Through the course of that, we became friends. Um, my, I was really most impressed with him is when I was shadowing him one time. Um, we went into a business deal and listened to it. I, I got to shadow and listen to it. And when we walked out, I knew that he could make millions on the deal. And they were super excited about working with him. And he told me, he's like, I'm not going to touch it. I'm going to turn it down. Um, because he knew it was going to harm the common good of people in the long run. And uh, the guy's integrity um, just really wowed me. Uh, it brought tears to my eyes to see that this guy, his, he doesn't, his highest desire was to do what's right 
And um, uh, anyways, just 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 an amazing man. So anyways, impacted me a lot. Um, he's helped navigate. Anytime I've gotten nervous or worried about uh, how to run the company or, uh, you know, navigating competition and and, and and an economy that's like, I remember we got closed down for three months. He helped us navigate on how to stay open, how to how to get back open, how to um, uh, just survive through all the COVID shutdowns, lockdowns. I'm Rachel with Tip Top Canine and we just wanna give a huge thank you to Clay and Vanessa Clark. Hey guys, I'm Ryan with Tip Top Canine. Just wanna say a big thank you to Thrive 15. Thank you to Make Your Life Epic. We love you guys, we appreciate you and really just appreciate how far you've taken us. This is our old house, right? This is where we used to live a few years ago. This is our old neighborhood. As you can see, it's uh, nice, right? So this is my old van and our old school marketing. And this is our old team. And by team, I mean it's me and another guy. This is our new house with our new neighborhood. This is our new van with our new marketing, and this is our new team. We went from four to 14, and I took this beautiful photo. We worked with several different business coaches in the past, and they were all about helping Ryan sell better and um, just teaching sales, which is awesome, but Ryan is a really great salesman, so we didn't need that. We needed somebody to help us get everything that was in his head out into systems, into manuals and scripts, and actually build a team. So now that we have systems in place, we've gone from one to 10 locations in only a year. In October 2016, we grossed 13 grand for the whole month. Uh, right now it's 2018, the month of October. It's only the 22nd. We've already grossed a little over 50 grand for the whole month and we still have time to go. We're just thankful for you, thankful for Thrive and your mentorship and we're really thankful that you guys have helped us to grow a business that we run now instead of the business running us. Just thank you, thank you, thank you times a thousand. The Thrive Time Show two-day interactive business workshops are the highest and most reviewed business workshops on the planet. You can learn the proven 13-point uh, business systems that Dr. Zellner and I have used over and over to start and grow successful companies. I mean, we get into the specifics, the specific steps on what you need to do to optimize your website. We're gonna teach you how to fix your conversion rate. Uh, we're gonna teach you how to do a social media marketing campaign that works. How do you raise capital? How do you get a small business loan? We teach you everything you need to know here during a two-day, 15-hour workshop. It's all here for you. You work every day in your business, but for two days you can escape and work on your business and build these proven systems so now you can have a successful company that will produce both the time freedom and the financial freedom that you deserve. You're gonna leave energized, motivated, but you're also gonna leave empowered. The reason why I've built these workshops is because as an entrepreneur, I always wish that I had this. And because there wasn't anything like this, I would go to these motivational seminars, no money down, real estate, Ponzi scheme, get motivated seminars, and they would never teach me anything. It was like you went there and you paid for the, the big chocolate Easter bunny, but inside of it, it was a hollow nothingness. And I wanted the knowledge, and they're like, oh, but we'll teach you the knowledge after our next workshop. And the great thing is we, we have nothing to upsell. At every workshop, we teach you what you need to know. There's no one in the back of the room trying to sell you some next big uh, get rich quick, walk on hot coals uh, product. It's literally, we teach you the brass tacks, the specific stuff that you need to know to learn how to start and grow a business. And I encourage you to not believe what I'm saying, and I want you to Google uh, the Z66 auto auction. I want you to Google elephant in the room. Look at Robert Zellner and Associates. Look them up and say, are they successful because they're geniuses or are they successful because they have a proven system? When you do that research, you will discover that the same systems that we use in our own business can be used in your business. Come to Tulsa, book a ticket, and I guarantee you it's going to be the best business workshop ever and we'll even give you your money back if you don't love it. We've built this facility for you and we're excited to see you. Hey, I'm Ryan Wimpy with Tip Top Canine, and I'm the founder. I'm Rachel Wimpy, and I am a co-founder. So we've been running Tip Top for about the last 14 years, franchising for the last three, four years. So someone that'd be a good fit for Tip Top loves dogs, they're high energy, uh, they want to be able to own their own job, but they don't want to worry about, you know, 
that high failure rate. They want to do that like bowling with bumper lanes. So you give us a call, reach out to us, and we'll call you. Um, and then we'll send you an FDD, look over that, read it, fall asleep to it, it's very boring. Um, and then we'll book a discovery day. And you come and you can spend a day or two with us to make sure that you actually like it, make sure your training dogs is something that you want to do. So an FDD is a franchise disclosure document. It's a federally regulated document that goes into all the nitty gritty details of what the franchise agreement entails. So who would be a good fit to buy a Tip Top K9 would be somebody who loves dogs, um, who wants to work with dogs all day as their profession. Um, you'll make a lot of money, you'll have a lot of fun, it's very rewarding. And who would not be a good fit is a cat person. So the upfront cost for Tip Top is $43,000. Uh, and a lot of people say they're generating doctor money, but on our disclosure, the numbers are anywhere from um, over a million dollars a year in dog training, what our Oklahoma City location did last year to 25, 35 grand a month. Um, to train and get uh, trained by us for Tip Top Canine, to run your own Tip Top Canine, you would be um, with us for six weeks here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So we've been married for seven years. Eight years. Eight years. So if you're watching this video, you're like, hey, maybe I want to be a dog trainer. Hey, that one sounds super amazing. Go to our website, tiptopcanine.com. Click on the yellow franchising tab, fill out the form, and Rachel and I will give you a call. Our Oklahoma City location last year, they did over a million dollars. Uh, he's been running that shop for three years. Before, he was a youth pastor with zero sales experience, zero dog training experience before he ever uh, met with us. So just call us. Um, come spend a day with us. Spend a couple days with us. Make sure you like training dogs and um, own your own business. Well, the biggest reason to buy a tip-top canine is so you own your own job and you own your own future and you don't hate your life. You get an enjoyable job that brings a lot of income but is really rewarding. My name is Seth Flint and I had originally heard about tip-top canine um, through uh, my old pastors who I worked for. They trained their Great Pyrenees uh, with Ryan and Tip Top K9. They did a phenomenal job and uh, became really good friends with Ryan and Rachel. I was working at a uh, local church and it was a great experience. I ended up uh, leaving there and working with uh, Ryan and Tip Top K9. The biggest thing that I really, really enjoy about being self-employed is that I can uh, create my own schedule. I have the ability to uh, spend more time um, with my family, my wife and my daughter. So my very favorite thing about training dogs with Tip Top Canine is that I get to work with the people. Um, obviously I love working with dogs, but it's just so rewarding to be able to um, train a dog um, that had serious issues, whether it's behavioral or you know whatever, and um, uh, seeing a transformation, taking that dog home, and mom and dad are literally in tears because of um, how happy they are um, with the training. If somebody is interested, I'd say don't hesitate. Make sure you like dogs. Make sure that uh, you enjoy um, working with people. Uh, because we're not just dog trainers, we're, we are customer service people that help dogs. And, um, and so definitely, definitely don't hesitate. Just, just come in and ask questions. Ask all the questions you have.